where the internet is somewhat unstable. <laughs> so if I please and then be patient, hopefully I'll come back. I wanted to start by showing you <clears throat> the way I typically work, which is this was white silk to begin with, and it was first marked with a deconstructed pattern, and I'm going to come up much closer so it helps you can see that. You'll see those kind of odd black splotches and these marks. So it's all happened from taking a rubbing with thickened dye and then you off print it onto the fabric. And the thing about it that is fascinating to me is that it makes a really unique kind of mark. And so it's that I'm always looking for ways to make different marks. And that's actually what the Akuma Mana print that's going to come a little bit later allows me to do also. So this started as white and then I um, did a, a monotype on it with the um, deconstructed and then it becomes a monoprint because I use a silk steam. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit or I'll ramble on that a little bit. Diane, could you speak a little bit closer to the microphone? Because we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. I think the sound isn't that great. Thank you. It was the difference between a monotype being it's just totally one of a kind and a monoprint, which is something that is permanent in the print and can be repeated. So that initially, <clears throat> the deconstruction is a monotype. It's going to dissolve, and each time you move the screen, you get a different print. But these circles that you see are silk screens, and they're permanent on the screen. And so this one-of-a-kind mono print is a silk scarf. Also, during this time of social distancing, my work changed a bit. And I started working smaller. And I was working, again, with monotypes and monoprints. But I did a lot of hand stitching. So I think you can see in the center of that kind of eyeball form some stitching. And there's stitching all over the surface of this. And there's even a little bit of beading. In this corner, there's thermofax printing. With the monotype that I'm going to be showing you, this the translation of the stitching is more like drawing marks. So there's lots of ways that they are indeed similar. Another way of doing Printmaking. This is a deconstructed silk screen, which was you initially saw that on the scarves, but this is done on paper. And and it's an exa a good example of. what happens with a mono print. You can see that the substrate, which I deconstructed onto the screen, remains the same. But here was an earlier print 
and here's a later print. And in the later ones, there's less of this original ink dye because it's dissolved and so it isn't there. And that's another thing that's wonderful about printmaking is that it, it can be very spontaneous, but it also allows you the opportunity to really quickly work in a series. And so that is something that I want to explore tonight. And also when, um, while I'm teaching this kitchen table monotype class, which will be Monday afternoons in September, me here and you in your kitchen or wherever you want to work. All right, so. With the spark that I showed you, even though it happens, the laying down of the color can happen pretty quickly, it takes days to make these because everything has to dry in between and you have to allow a certain amount of time for the dyes to become permanent and then you wash it out and each one of those steps the piece changes considerably that's one of the things that i'm finding fascinating about working with these akua inks is that they are really fast and they don't change. So it's different. Hmm. <clears throat> Working with all of these things, um, it's a lot like making a stir fry. It takes most of your time is spent in the preparation before you actually cook the meal. So for this, most of my time was spent in getting things set up before I actually do the printing. And some of the things that you have to do You have to tear down your paper. Well, you have to decide what papers you're going to use. Tonight, I'm going to be showing you a Kozo, which is a Japanese thin paper, sometimes called rice paper. But my printmaker husband pointed out they don't make paper from rice. But right on, right on the label, it said rice paper, but it's called Kozo. And it's here. And it, that has a real advantage for some of the uh, monotype that we're doing. I'm also going to use a somewhat heavier, um, trackier 300 printmaking paper. Both of these are really readily available um, in, and not terribly expensive. We, I will be using some Akua plexiglass tape. I will also be using Mylar as a plate. And I'm working small because this is all planning for what, what room people may have or may not have to work on. But there's really no reason why you couldn't work as big as your paper if that's what you chose to do. It's not what I'm going to be showing you, but it is what can be done. Um, you will need sprayers. 
we will need if it can turn that towards the box. We'll need inks. Um, most of what you're seeing there came from the Akua sampler. Um, you will need something. Uh, you'll need a big piece of plastic to cover your table. And that might be it. It'll come to me. Um, okay. So what we're going to start with are the is something that's called a um, trace line monotype, and it is just exactly what it sounds like. You're going to, I'm going to lay out some ink. I'm going to put paper down on top of it, and then I'm going to trace a line on the back of the paper. And it's going to transfer, and I'm going to show you. Hey, Diane, are the inks are the inks oil or water based? Water. They are water. They are water based, but they are made with uh, soy, and so for that reason, they clean up really, really easily. Here, here is a trace monotype. And it that they typically develop that kind of fuzzy line because you're making direct contact only with a point and then where the paper hits onto the plate, it picks up the other mark. And if this is something you wanted to learn more about, you could look at up Degas or Gauguin or Paul Clay. All of them have done a lot of work with this trace line. Some of the things that you should have prepared, um, you should have torn down your paper, have newsprint for testing things out, have, uh, I think I told you about the COSO and the staff here. Um, you'll need to make a registration key. Mine is very rudimentary, and I'm not going to be talking much about that tonight, but that helps you keep your paper aligned as you are doing it. So let's see. We're going to start by rolling out some ink. So this is just a, a sheet of plexiglass that I, you can get this at Lowe's or Home Depot. I got it from all things plastic, which is in my neighborhood. And you can, you could also just roll it out on a sheet of mylar. So just something that is smooth and easy to clean up. Could you hand me the carbon box? Yep. And for those of you who have done print making, this is very different in that you can see it's much more liquid. And so when you do this, you start by stirring it. 
will save your popsicle sticks. And you can see how much thinner it is than typical Italio sticks. For that reason, I'm going to be adding some magnesium carbonate to it, which thickens it up. If I didn't do that, it would really um, get all over the paper. And since I have managed to get it all over myself, <laughs> I'm going to use a handy bag and my handy husband is going to hand me my diluted dawn and I'll be good as new. And so this is another thing that's really important to have. You could put it in a spray bottle, but it's a little bit easier to control if you can just kind of walk it on. Magnesium carbonate is what I'm using to thicken this. And if you don't happen to live with the printmaker the way I do, um, you can buy it. This giant thing is about $8. Or you can use baby powder. Or I've read that you can use um, Point story. Diane, quick question for you. Um, can the Akua paint be used on fabric? And if so, would you still need to add the magnesium carbonate to it to thicken it? On to fabric? No, I just want the palette knife. Um, I'm sorry? <clears throat> Ask the question again, please, Vita. Oh, yeah. Um, can this Akua paint be used on fabric, and if it can be, does it need to be thickened with a carbonate, a magnesium carbonate? Um, I've only done a little bit of experimenting with it on fabric. And for that, I used a jelly plate. And so it was a totally different process. I'm planning on August to allow me the time to play around and figure that out. Um, for the jelly plate, I, I actually even thinned it down. And I'll show you that sample in a minute. So, I'm just mixing this up and I, I've managed to get Swing in there, which maybe I'll print it in a little bit. So this still looks a little thin to me. I'm going to add a little more carbonate. A lot more. And again, what this does is make the ink more sticky and less runny. Any mixing tricks or techniques that um, you have for us in, in, in this process? Uh, yeah, don't dump as much magnesium carbonate down in front of an audience, as I just did. Um, it's just, it's like anything else. You kind of get a sense of it, and it's, it's really not that critical. Um, 
because I'll know I'm going to do a little sample on newsprint, and if that's not working, then I'll make adjustments. And I believe that this is called a drawdown, but that may be a little above my pay grade. <laughs> All right, so because I'm working on a very small place, I'm going to use a small grayer. And when you first do it, it makes, it makes kind of well, now it's already beginning to make hissing noise, and you want, you want that hissing noise, because that means that the ink is adhering evenly to the grayer. When I first did it, it was in long slates. I'm just rolling out, transferring the ink from the inking station to the plate. And I'm trying to get a relatively even roll on it. And the plate that you're using is also just a plexi sheet? It's, this one is a, a cut down Okua plate. Um, that I got from artists and craftsmen because at the time I didn't know if students would have access to plexi. Um, and, and these are readily available, but they, they are thin and flexible, but heavier than um, than the mylar. So it's a little bit easier because of that. All right, so here's my printing station. I've got a right angle cut out cardboard that's going to hold that plate in place. I'm just going to put down that paper in hopes of keeping the clean edge, not my strong suit. And I'm going to find where I put my So this is just a torn down piece of newsprint. I'm just going to drop it on there and just make a mark, maybe touch it a few times to see. And if I had not put that magnesium carbonate in it, there would be a lot of this surface um, so it worked out pretty well. All right. So the Koso paper has 
two sides. It has a rougher side and a smoother side. And we're going to use the smoother side. And it's really a bigger sheet than I need. But So just like I do with the um, silk, I tend to just work spontaneously. And so that's what you're going to see now. This has not been pre-planned. And in fact, I don't know. I see it over there. Could you get my pencil, please, Richard? Um, this is a bookmaking tool and it works very well for this but the pencil will allow you well I'll do I'll do one both ways. So here I'm just drawing a mark with that tool. But I was thinking that the pencil might show up better on the camera and it does. Um, I can see both. I can so you can see how that has transferred. Now I might want to just Diane, quick question. Uh, yeah. what would what would happen if you're doing this process without the magnesium carbonate again? It would be um there would be a lot more kind of grayed areas. Here's one on it. Uh, this one shows it more. You see all of this. There was magnesium carbonate in it, but not as much as I have put on tonight. So you get this. I like it, it um, but it can really be it can really cover, it can take over. So you want, you want a happy medium for your medium. So you can see that I'm hmm. putting that in, I can. How lightly or um, not lightly are you pressing to make that kind of tone? Very lightly. Um, I'm not going <laughs> to leave it there. Um, so here's a heavier tone, heavier pressed. With my fingernail and the side of my finger, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to get. That's the beauty of there's kind of the gray behind it and the darker line. Hmm. Uh, uh. That I rubbed quite a bit. And you can, you know, work that into one. For us, it's kind of hard to see if you can see the image on your plate, on the paper. Um, yes. Are you able to see the marks that you're making or are you guessing a lot of the time? Um, no, with the Tozo paper, I can actually see it. It's coming through. Mm. Clearly not as much as you Nice, it's already so beautiful. Thank you, Dita. Um, I'm kind of picking up a fake plate mark now. Um, 
un instant. I think we'll leave that be now. Um, maybe I'm just, I'm going to rub this a little more while it's still still down. So now I'm going to let that dry for a little bit. Um, and if there's time, I'll work back into it tonight. And if there isn't, then I'll work back into it alone. Uh, How long does it usually take to dry? Well, that is something I don't know. Um, it will be ready for me to work on it. I mean, it would be ready in a half an hour. But in terms of it being totally dry, it, these inks dry by absorption. They have to absorb into the paper. So it really depends on the paper. Whereas like many of the dyes or acrylics, I mean, acrylic dries immediately. If we were doing this with acrylic, the party would be over already by now because it would have dried on the plate. That's the beauty of the Akua ink. I can, I can, like, either you, you were witness to how that mark occurred because we demoed it last night. And this is still from last night, it's fine. It, it will stay for a couple of days. So that's a real advantage for me in the studio. I, but I, I don't know the answer of if I was going to be shipping this out. I don't know how long it takes. Um, the cameraman has a suggestion. What you should say? Probably going to take days. Yeah, I think it will take days. And it probably depends. I think if we were in um, Arizona, hmm. I think it would dry faster than in humid. But I don't really know. All right. So, um, Diane, how much thought do you give to the image being in reverse? None. Um, I, you won't see me doing writing for that reason, but because I'm really working spontaneously, it, it, I don't, I don't give it a whole lot of thought. Um, but it. For someone who did, then they would want to I don't know. Maybe pre plan on tracing paper, test it out. Um, if I work that way, I'd be doing something else. It's use it as a guide. But that's nice to know um, that like you can use tracing paper if you do work in a more pre-planned way and not spontaneously and, and kind of use it on top of the sheet right. as and your guide I, for making marks. Yes, in fact, I'm going to show you that because time is moving along <laughs> and I'm not. So let's see. We're going to um as you're preparing, can you tell us how many projects do you work on at a given time? Do you work on multiple things or kind of take things one at a time? No, I because if I'm working with silk, it takes you know, it has to set up overnight at, at a minimum, and it can be days. I typically have more than one thing going at a time, but I don't know about everybody else. There's just nothing typical in my life 
right now. So that I don't quite know how to answer that. I'm, I'm doing all of this and I, I will, you know, like the one, the little one that we did this evening, when I go home and have dinner tonight, I'll think about, oh boy, I can go play with that tomorrow. And I don't have to worry about blank paper. But I mean, you can see there's, there's not a whole lot of worrying for me with the start of this. Mm -hmm. I'll make one more just for the heck of it. So while we've got that ink out, the two sides of the cozo. Put that down. Drop it down again. And it may well pick up some of the trace marks from the previous print so that it may break off. And for that reason, I'll try and draw a slightly wider mark. And see, and I think you can begin to see a little bit that it does show through. Do you have any other favorite tools that you use for this process other than the pencil and the tool, the bookmaking tool? Um, I mean, I've certainly seen people use other things. This, this is what I gravitate to right now. And people, you, I, I'm curious about something called a instead of a Q tip, it's called a G tip. Um, and it's it's for cleaning guns. But it 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 um it makes a more precise mark than the Q tip. So you can already get a sense my handy cameraman wants to show me to show you using a wooden spoon. It's really going to pick up a lot of ink. And so mm -hmm. And then we could also use a barren. Looking at the white line. That's nice. So you can see, I don't, maybe you can see. Are those white marks in the texture from the previous print? Indeed they are. And so, <coughs> That makes this kind of a combination of a traced line monotype and a dark field monotype. In a dark field monotype, you remove different um, areas of the ink and then print that. So while we're set up for it, I will. So I'm just going to be using a brush and push away some of the ink. Like that.
And then pick up even more. So is this process kind of like the reverse process, the process of what you first showed us? Yes. In the in the one I've got um, the white of the paper and I'm picking up the black ink and making marks on it. This, it's all dark until I wipe it away. And you notice that in this, that was a a ghost really left over from the original line drawing that I've done. If we weren't pressed for time, I'd work more on this, but here we are. Smooth side down. I'm going to take a piece of tape and make a hinge up there, but even though this is painter's tape, it's a little too sticky with the cozo, so I'm applying it liberally to my nasty apron. Um, taking some of the sticky off it. So I'm just putting it down now. I'm going to use the Baron. And so I'm going to go back and really rub areas more so that it's darker. Um, but had I started from a solid black plate, and remove the ink, I would have gotten darker areas, but this allows more of a range. Will you use Akua inks to introduce color in your class? Yes, I will. And I'll show you some right this minute. Um, and could you show us the print that you just made a little closer? Because it looks amazing. Mm -hmm. All Diane's work is amazing. <laughs> and I'm already beginning to wear it. <laughs> um, okay, so. Here was an earlier trace line monotype on a heavier weight paper. And that little blue thing that you see there is painter's tape. And I did a tracing of it so that I could use this as a mask, as a, so that I can add color in areas where I want it and keep it away from areas that I don't want it. Um, but, So you just tape the 
the I mask did. to the print? I did. Uh, oh, you kind of like roll it as a double-sided thing? Yeah, I just made a little. And did oh. you like de-sticky it beforehand? Uh, no, I didn't. Oh, because it's tougher paper. Okay. It's heavier paper and it really shouldn't matter. Um, but what I didn't plan for, I can do now. And that is, I like that. Yeah. So this is a brayer that I use to roll out. this piece, of, and I'm looking at you, it's going to be hard for you to read this as different than black, but it is a deep khaki black. Um, okay. and so I'm just rolling that directly And I have an avocado pit <laughs> in the middle of my image. And to save precious time, I am going to just roll right up to the edge. So now we have some deep khaki and black and white and I'm going to put down a different ink piece of plexi. And I'm hoping to get from red line to I'm using the back of my paintbrush. I don't hate that, <laughs> but I think you can see that the um, tracing paper was really necessary. So I could and probably will continue to work back into this, but one of the things that is wonderful about this is because it's paper, you can work back into it with watercolors. This was um, a shout out to my daughter, my Christmas present. It is a um, oven mitt. That silicone is wonderful for stamping. Um, I'll, I'll just stamp it here so that you can see. And if I've missed an area, this was loaded up, please. 
what he's doing is just just lay it down on that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> There's the original ink plate that we moved to get it out of the way. If you just lay your pieces down on that, it'll pick up the ink and it makes wonderful marks. Um, what Pascal. Um, Could we see that again? I'm sorry, that wasn't uh, too fast. Slow enough. <laughs> Lovely. So that's one that um, goes up paper again. Mm -hmm. This one to me looks very much like a lithograph or a charcoal drawing, but it is a dark field monotype. So it started out, it was totally ink, and then I removed the ink, I printed the whole thing, then I drew back into it more traced line style, and then eventually just went back over it with watercolor. So there's really, I mean, that's what I meant when I said when I go home tonight, I can sit there and think about the fun I can have in here tomorrow. Generally, it seems like the process is uh, really experimental and there's a lot of room for innovation and kind of play, it seems really fun. Do you just I, have fun? I think that that's where its history came from and that in, in many ways, printmaking itself is very structured and organized and done in a linear kind of fashion. And this is not, it is, that's why I think they call it the painterly print because it's more spontaneous. Um, mm -hmm. You do not have the option of doing an addition, which is something you can do with all the other more structured prints. But man, you can fly through these and really be thinking your way through for another process, if that's what you wanted to do. I tend to just move narrowly along. Nice. Well, well Diane, thank you so much. This was so much fun. And someone said it was like really relaxing to watch and it really was. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for taking I'm your time. You're very welcome, and I do hope that um, I'm going to get the opportunity to see some of you folks who watch Monday afternoons, one to three, for 10 weeks, and we'll do all of this and so much more. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Join us tomorrow for, for our last Slicer from a Distance. It will be a live painting demonstration and a spoken word performance with our, our faculty member, Bernard Collins. Diane, this was amazing. Thank you for sharing your talents and your studio. And Richard, thank you for operating the camera. <laughs> yes. uh, we really appreciate it. You were fantastic. And, and thank Thanks so much, everybody. Internet. We're not on us. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.